Hi guys, welcome to your chapter 9 part 1 video. This content in chapter 9 is probably like 50% uh, review or extension on what we've seen the last chapter. There is some new stuff in terms of looking at outliers and scatter plots, and that may be the hardest part of this. But I think in many ways what we're going to do with the linear regression model in chapter 9 is going to be intuitive. Um, it's not going to be hugely mathematical. Uh, and you will be able to, again, determine uh, when and when not to appropriately, uh, appropriately use the linear regression model. So, let's check out slide one here. They say, suppose you wanted to predict the trend in first marriage age for American women into the early part of the century. Note this text is from like around 2000, so if they may make a prediction past that point, obviously it was into the future. Given below are the years at which the average age for women <coughs> to marry was recorded, and a scatter plot of years versus first marriage age for women. Um, really, I have put the years at which the average age for women uh, to marry was recorded in a scatter plot, or and the uh, the associated average age uh, for first marriage of women in this second slide here. Just because in the second slide we're going to really get to. Uh, developing a linear regression model here. So you've got um, kind of redundant with the scatter plot, but just presented differently. In a 10 year interval, a piece from 1900 to 1910, et cetera, et cetera. From this point to this point, you're going from 21.9 years of age on average for women to be married to 21.6 to 21.2. And all of these jumps in the first row here are 10 years apiece. So you're going 1900, 1910, 1920, etc. And then in the second row, they are five year intervals. So you're looking at 1955 to 1960, etc., etc. And that's reflected in the scatter plot here. And in part A, they are asking us use all or part of the data to create an appropriate model for predicting the average age at which women will marry, uh, first marry in 2005. Okay, so hopefully we're remembering from last chapter, what they're asking us to do is a risky move. Um, we don't have the average marriage age um, for first marriage of women in 2005, so this is going past the X values that we have here in the data, so this would be an extrapolation. Uh, so take note of that before we get started here. Um, second thing, they say use all or part of the data and hopefully that's clear why we wouldn't want to use all of the data here. We're seeing kind of a, um, almost a quadratic form here to the data, but we could reinterpret that as not being quadratic, but instead being linear with a negative association uh, between 1900 and about 1955 or 1950, and then from 1955 or 1960, you've got a, a distinct positive trend here, okay? Um, so, why don't we cut this data up if we're trying to make a prediction? Remember that this linear model that we're using really depends upon having a linear form. And we don't have that in the, in the scatter plot of all the data, so we're gonna cut it into just a small little patch. We'll use basically the, um, the data values in blue. Let's, for the sake of convenience here, use the, um, Really, these are coordinate pairs, but the years aren't listed. The years with average age at first marriage for women in this second row. So we're going to use the second row here to see if we can develop a linear model. So we're going 1955 to 1960 on up to 1995 here with average age given. So note from your scatter plot, we're predicting first marriage age from the year. So obviously, your explanatory variable is the year after 2000. Let's go to um, Wabbit here. Turn this on. I've already entered into L1, your explanatory variable worth of information. 1955 up to 1985. There's 1995. That's the end of the list. It matches. The end of the list matches with L2, which is your response variable as I've used it. Uh, 24.5, 23.9, et cetera, et cetera. On up to uh, the line, everything should match. Okay, so from here, remember when you're building a linear regression model, there are two things that you really need to do. The first, you've been doing for a while. You're going to go to your stat plot, choose a scatter plot, 
set up your X list, set up your Y list, and check out what that scatter plot looks like using Zoom Zoom Sat. And we see this is why the residual plot's so important because, excuse me, um, we see a fairly linear form, uh, fairly positive association in the linear association in the, the scatter plot. But that's it's not abundantly clear how appropriate this data is for a linear model until we use our magnifying glass. Um, let's go to from here. To get the residual list, to get a residual plot, again, you go stat, calc, down to linreg, which does, remember, quite a few things here. Um, and if we want the residual list, it's important that we give the order of the, the variables very specifically here. Um, our x list is L1. We're going to do comma, L2 for the average years um, in L2. Hit enter on that. And remember, it's hiding a list that it's giving here. It's finding all the residuals, all the differences between the actual Y values that you have in this second row and the Y values that the linear model would predict. Okay, The linear model is given here by Linreg, remember. Y equals AX plus B is um, Oh, kind of a shorthand way to write the uh, linear regression model with A being the coefficient for your X variable. So A must be your slope, 0.1163, uh, and B, therefore, not being a coefficient for an, a variable, must be your Y-intercept here. Um, so we've, we've got the residuals. I don't necessarily want to use A and B just yet because I don't know that the linear model is appropriate. All I've done is check out the scatter plot. The second thing I need to do to determine if the linear model is appropriate is go back to stat plot. We'll go to the same plot because we're still making a scatter plot. Don't change your X list. Do change your Y list. In this case, to resid. We'll hit enter on that. And now this is our magnifying glass. Again, we'll go zoom, zoom, stat. And it's clear from the residual list that we've got that we don't have a truly random association in our data. Um, we've got positive residuals through here and here. We've got negative residuals in the middle. And the net effect is that we're seeing kind of a quadratic um, form to our residuals list. We have a pattern residuals list. So that's a bad thing for a linear model. And normally we would not want to build the linear model. But this is what I want to point out. When the question asks the following, they say use all or part of the data to create an appropriate model. There's no uh, ambiguity there. They are telling us absolutely create, the, create a model. Make it as appropriate as you can. So even though we're seeing a residuals list that doesn't do what we want, we're going to, you would say that. You would say, okay, I'm giving a model, but my residuals list is patterned indicating that the linear model that we're going to find, or give in this case, is probably not going to best describe what the data is doing. But it's the best we can do at the moment. So we'll go second quit. And um, OK, so our linear model is y hat equals 0.1163 times x minus 207.9. Alternatively, instead of y hat, you could say um, average age hat, if you want to be a little bit more specific. Same slope here uh, times the year um, plus the same y intercept. Change. Okay, so we've given a linear model. Two things again that you would do when you report this you're going to say first. First, we used uh, data from, let's see, 1955 to 1995, 1955 to 1995 to generate the model. That's important to note that you're not using all of the data. Do that if you're building a linear regression model from a scatter plot where you're cutting it up like we've done here. And then secondly, 
um, note that we had a patterned residuals plot. Man, I jump all over the place when I'm writing these letters out. I don't know why. Patterned resid plot. That is to say, our linear model probably does not best explain the data. Okay, all right. So we've done a couple of things here. Uh, we knocked out A, and then in B, how much faith do you place in this prediction? Well, we've already um, done some foreshadowing there. We already talked about that. The, we really shouldn't have that much faith, faith in this prediction because we're, um, they want us to use the model for the year 2005 and come up with the average marriage age. Okay, which, so we really didn't finish part A. We've got one more piece here using our linear model. Let's take, I'll take this form right here. So average age hat is equal to 0.1163 times 2005 or years. Um, minus that 207.9 that we saw above. Let's see if I can go to my notes to see what I calculated that to be real quick. Um, okay, so 25.282 would be the average age that we would predict women would be married in 2005 in the U.S. Okay, so again, we can't really place that much faith in the prediction because we're um, extrapolating. We're going beyond the, the x values that we have to make a prediction. So we looked into the future. Again, the problem there, and you can see this um, in the scatter plot. Clearly, um, as time goes on, the data won't necessarily have the same linear trend. From 1900 to 1955, we saw a very different linear trend than from 1960 to 1995. All right. So okay. That so in summary, make sure that you're using data appropriate from the scatter plot. You won't always want to use all of the data there if you're trying to build a prediction. Um, okay, second thing here, and this is really, I feel like probably the, do I wanna say more important? Yeah, it really is the more important content. And it's also new content, so make sure you're paying uh, good attention to this. All right, outliers are coordinate pairs in a scatter plot far from the rest of the data. They have potentially high residuals, high leverage, and or high influence upon R, the correlation coefficient, to consider. Um, let's define those three things here real quick. A high residual outlier is an outlier with a large vertical distance from the least squares regression line, or from the regression line. Least squares is a fancy way of saying the regression line. Um, okay, so that means, to check to see if an outlier has a high residual, you're just looking at the vertical distance from it to the, to the line. High leverage is um, a, an outlier that has a big distance from the center of the data, x bar, y bar. X bar, y bar. We've looked at x bar, y bar when we talked about how every regression line will go through that point, um, and it's something we can count on. Every regression line ever goes through x bar, y bar based upon how we build the best fit line. All right, lastly, an influential point is an outlier that forces a regression line to behave significantly differently than it would according to the rest of the data. That is to say, if we took the outlier from the scatter plot, the regression line, the best fit line, would look very different. So we've got two images here that we're going to use as a little bit of an intro. Um, what I want you to do when you're looking at outliers, whether or not it's um, for one problem where they're not asking specifically about outliers, but you see them present anyway, or if they are asking specifically about outliers, I want you to, as best you can, draw two lines through the data. The first line, which you see here in blue, is what you at least think, if you don't have it available, what you at least think the regression line is going to be with that outlier, and then in red, is I want you to, or not necessarily in another color, but maybe just, um, oh, I'm losing it, um, as a dotted line. That's what I'm trying to say. As a dotted line, you could represent 
what the regression line would be without the outlier. So in this case, obviously, hopefully it's clear, this guy over here is your outlier, and we want to talk about what it's doing. So in blue, we have the regression line with that outlier present. In red, we have the regression line without the outlier, okay? Um, let's talk about, first of all, whether or not this circled point has a high residual. Don't be confused here. This first line that we drew in blue is the regression line with the outlier present. So clearly, this black circle line does not have a high residual because it has pulled the regression line being so far from the... Uh, from the rest of the data, it has pulled the regression line towards it, and in fact, the regression line goes through that point. So it does not have a high residual. However, it does have a high, uh, high leverage here. If you were to find the center of the data, perhaps x bar would be right there, and y bar right here, okay? The center of your x's, the center of your y's, both noted. Clearly, you've got a really big distance from that center point, which is not, it's not necessarily one of the data points, to that um, outlier, okay? That means that it has high leverage, and therefore um, will generally have a big influence upon, upon the uh, regression line. And in this case, it does. Clearly, you can see, and the, the big reason why we, we draw two lines to look at what the outlier is doing is here when you're talking about the influential point, whether or not you have an influential point in your outlier. We do in this case. This outlier um, being present has made a clear difference from the red uh, best fit line that we would have seen without that outlier to the blue line with the outlier. So again, recap, uh, we don't have a high residual because the regression line goes through that point. We do have high leverage because you've got a big distance from the center of your data and the point is influential. The regression line has significantly changed uh, from what it would have been without that outlier present. Okay, same thing over here. Second um, image. Let's go ahead and first in blue, draw what we think the regression line might be with that point present. Um, because it's so much higher than the rest of the data, it won't necessarily, the regression line won't necessarily go through any of those bottom points. Um, that point being so far, pulls it up just a little bit, okay? Now in red, same way as before, I'm gonna draw a line here that represents what we think the best fit line would be without that outlier present, okay? And that's gonna be a little bit clearer. It's down a little bit further. So, let's talk again about whether or not this black outlier is going to have a high residual. Yeah, well yeah, clearly. This blue line, um, distance from that, this is great compared to the rest of the points. We've got a high resid. Okay. Secondly, let's talk about whether or not we've got a high leverage outlier. Well, if the center of the data runs approximately through here for X, and probably through here, maybe that's even higher than it should be for Y, yeah, again, we've got a high leverage point. Your, your distance from the center of the data fairly great, okay? Um, is the point influential? Well, yeah, somewhat. Notice here that it's this point, this um, black outlier is influential in a very different way. What we anticipate to see for the best fit line in blue versus the best fit, fit line in red for this second scatter plot is not that the slopes are different as they were in the, the first image, but rather that it looks like the y-intercepts um, are going to be very different for each of these lines. Unlike in the first scatter plot, the slopes were significantly different, but it certainly looks like you're going to hit the y-axis at about the same point. So the way in which your outlier can be influential doesn't always, it's not always slope, it's not always y-intercept, it can be either or, okay? All right, so let's continue to look at a few more images like this, because I think it's harder for people to visualize. Um, so remember, if you're dealing with a strongly influ influential coordinate pair in a scatter plot, it's usually best to develop a regression line for the data with the influential coordinate pair, and also a regression line for the data without the influential coordinate pair. In the same way that I said, if you had a um, the histogram of data, to if you were finding um, the median or the mean. If you're finding a center um, statistic from a histogram, if you had an outlier, report that center statistic 
and your um, spread statistics with or without that outlier to show what change um, that outlier is going to have. Okay, same thing here. We're not building regression lines for these four images, so I, I should, should be clear there. All we're doing is talking about what these outliers are doing. So let's first start by highlighting the outliers. Whoop. Cord's getting caught on the table here. Okay, so we've got an outlier here, 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 and here. Okay, so image A, this guy, um, they want us to identify, does the stray have high leverage, a, a large residual, or both? Then secondly, they want is the point an influential point. So let's start the same way. In blue, let's talk about what we think the best fit line may look like with that outlier present. Um, this may be easier in this particular case to start with the red, what it would look like without it. Okay, so we've see, we see a clear linear um, trend in the data if we take that outlier out that follows, that would go through the, most of the data. With that point, you might be looking at something closer to this, okay? So we're seeing that um, anticipating whether or not we have high leverage, yeah, absolutely, because that point's so far from the center, um, at the center of the data, again, maybe right here for X bar, maybe right here for Y bar, we have a, a high distance from the center, so we have high leverage, okay? Um, we would also, if we build this blue regression line a little bit further, we're also seeing fairly clearly here a high residual. We've got a fairly big distance, vertical distance, from what the regression line would predict for that particular y value um, given the input of x. Um, so yeah, we've got high leverage, large residual, in this case we have both. Do you think the point is an influential point? Well, that should be clear from what we built here, anticipating what the best fit line would look like before and after, um, including that outlier, okay? So in this case, yeah, it's absolutely influential. C, if the point were removed from the data, would the correlation be stronger or weaker? Okay, so this is new. Um, so if we took this black circle point out, remember that correlation is the strength of the linear association. Do you think that the red regression line reflecting what this um, data, the association the data would be following if the point were gone, um, do you think that that would be, have a stronger correlation than with the, the point present? Well, hopefully it's clear in this case that yeah, absolutely. We're, we are following a better linear trend if you would take that black circle point out so the correlation would be stronger, okay? Um, notice, remember here, that correlation being strong versus weak does not mean the following. It doesn't mean positive versus negative. A negative correlation of negative one is a very strong correlation, right? Because that means your data follows, follows perfectly on a line here, right? R equals negative one. So that would be a strong correlation even though it's a low number. So strong versus weak correlation is just What's the magnitude of the correlation? Are you close um, to an absolute value of one? All right, okay, so quick recap there. Okay, so yeah, we said in C for image A, the correlation would be stronger. It would follow a line a little bit better. And then D, if that point were removed, would the slope of the regression line increase or decrease? Um, well, clearly, because we, I think it, this is why it's helpful to try to do your best here to draw a best fit line with or without that point present. Um, that's gonna be ab absolutely clear from what we've drawn. The point we removed, the slope of the regression line would increase, right? We're going from a, in blue, with the outlier present, we've got a fairly gradual rise. In red, we've got a steeper rise. Therefore, the slope goes up. It would increase. All right, um, let's look directly below that to image B. Talk about if this stray, this outlier has high leverage, large residual, or both again. Well, again, start by trying to come up with, in red, what the regression line would look like without that present. Well, notice if we take out that top right outlier, you've got a correlation that would be ab absolutely close to zero because there's no linear trend. If the correlation is close to zero and we know that the slope is built based upon correlation, therefore the slope has to be close to zero as well. So our line would look horizontal versus undefined slope would be for vertical lines, remember? So with the outlier absent from the data, 
we would expect something like this, okay? And then in blue, with the outlier present, we might see something more like that, okay? Um, hitting the data as best it can. Okay, so does this tray have high leverage, large residual, or both? Um, high leverage, uh, yeah, absolutely. Again, we've got high leverage because if your center for x values is approximately right through here, and your center for y values is right along maybe that red line, then you've got a, a big distance from that center of the data. Um, large residual, no, because in blue, we anticipate a, a line of best fit to actually come close to that data because there's no other linear trend present. That, because that point is so far from the um, shapeless cluster to the left, that um, given that it has high leverage, um, think in terms of, again, sort of the, well, oh, I didn't use that analogy to present correlation coefficient, but basically, if, you're, if you don't have any other points that are doing anything for the correlation, no other points with high leverage, this single point top right is going to be the only thing that's influencing your slope and therefore your regression line. Um, so in this case, we would anticipate, yeah, that there, there would be a very small residual because the line of best fit in blue is probably going to come close to that point. Nothing else is forcing a linear trend but that point. So in this case, again, we've got both. Do you think the, the point is an influential point? Um, yeah, clearly it is. Red versus blue, check out the, uh, the slope that you see there. Not only is the slope different, but the y-intercept looks to, to be a little bit different as well. Um, so, sure, influential point, we've got a significant change in the regression line. See if that point were removed from the data, would the correlation be stronger or weaker? In this case, unlike the last one, the correlation would actually be weaker, right? Because we see, with that top right point present, we're seeing something of a line where there wouldn't have been one otherwise. If you take that outlier out, you've, you've got a, a shapeless mass of points in your scatter plot, and therefore you've got a really weak correlation, so weaker in this case for C. D, if that point were removed, would the slope of the regression line increase or decrease? Well, clearly, from the, from the image that we drew, the slope would de decrease. We've gone from some sort of rise uh, that's positive to basically none at all. Okay, so image C now, let's start again the same way. I think probably be easier to start with in red, the slope without that outlier. We might see something like this. And then with the outlier, because it's directly above the points, we may just see that the regression line comes close to that point, raises up a little bit. Um, so kind of like what we saw in one of the scatter plots last slide. All right, so does this tray have high leverage? Um, you know, not really this time. Check it out. If he, this is the center of your x values, and that's the center of your y values right here. No, we're not far from the center at all. Um, do we have a large residual? Yeah, we do. Um, that if that blue line represents what we anticipate to see for the regression line, we're relatively far from it in terms of a vertical distance. B, do you think the point is an influential point? Um, no, not really. I mean, do you see a change in the regression line? Yeah. Is it a big change? No, because um, the slope's awfully close to being the same from blue to red, and the y-intercept would also be about the same from blue to red. There's not a big vertical distance between the two, relatively speaking. Um, so no, it's not an influential point, despite the fact that it had a large residual. So if that point were removed from the data and C, would the correlation be stronger or weaker? Um, well, does the point, again, ask yourself with correlation, does the point follow, um, does it encourage or discourage the linear trend we see in the data? Well, in this case, it clearly discourages it. All the data mostly below that um, outlier at the top of the scatter plot follows a fairly strong linear trend. That outlier is existing off on its own here, um, so the correlation would actually be stronger again, like it was in part A. D, if that point were removed, would the slope of the regression line increase or decrease? It looks like in this case, don't assume that they're saying, would it do one or the other? That's necessarily the only two options. In this case, the slope really wouldn't change. Um, it doesn't seem to be affected by that particular outlier. 
Okay, here in D, we got one more time here. We're going to go ahead and show um, regression line without that point. Well, in this case, we're seeing that the line is basically going towards that point regardless. So here, the red and blue lines both look like they'd be, excuse me, just about the same. Okay. Um, so does the point have high leverage? Well, yeah, it does, ironically enough, because even though you're the center of your x values may be right over here, and the center of your y values is right over there, again, the rest of the data has the association that's only further strengthened by that outlier. So it's, it does have high leverage, but sort of doing a foreshadowing here, it's not influential. The, the two regression lines we would anticipate to be about the same. Does it have a large residual? No because the regression lines are coming awfully close to that point anyway. All right, we already talked about the influence. See if that point were removed from the data, would the correlation be stronger or weaker? Um, well, uh, this, this may be tough. The correlation, you might be tempted to say the correlation really wouldn't change, but it, it actually would be stronger in this case uh, with the last point in the scatter plot. Why? Because Without that point top left, yes, you have a linear trend, but with it, your linear trend is only further encouraged, okay? So the correlation would be just a little bit stronger for that outlier top left. And then D, if that point were removed, would the slope of the regression line increase or decrease? Doesn't look like it would change yet again, okay? All right, so I'm going to give you guys some problems involving those where you're looking at what an outlier is actually doing to your regression line. The AP exam loves to ask questions on these. They're easy to do for multiple choice. Um, so when you are doing your homework in class and if you feel like you're getting stuck, please let me know because I want to make sure that these are not tremendously challenging for you come AP exam time because I don't think that they're too bad. They're not particularly mathematical. All right. Um, let's see. Are we in? Yeah, we're in our last example here. Okay, so four women. And let me see if I can talk about what we're going to do in this. Um, oh, okay. So this, this problem is talking about uh, the, the effects of an outlier and whether or not it would be reasonable to include this outlier when we build a linear model. So it's almost like, it's almost like what we did in the first part of the notes. We were talking about um, whether or not we wanted to include particular groups of points in our linear regression model. All right, so for women, pregnancy lasts about nine months. In other species of animals, the length of time from conception to birth varies. Is there any evidence that gestation period is related to the animal's lifespan? Gestation period is the time in the womb. First scatter plot shows gestation period in days versus lifespan in years for 18 species of animals or mammals. The highlighted point at the far right represents humans. For these data, the correlation coefficient is 0.54, which is not a very strong relationship. Do you think the association would be stronger or weaker? In this case, they really, I wish they would say, do you think the, the linear association, and we know that linear associations measure with the correlation coefficient, do you think the linear association would be stronger or weaker if humans were removed? Explain. Well, let's do what we did just last slide. Let's build a, in red here, what we think a linear regression model would look like if you did not include that X point which is gestation and life expectancy in years for humans, you might see something like this, okay? But with that point present, because it's so far from the center of your data, it has high leverage, and therefore, in general, they will have high influence as well. In this case, it does, because it's not following the trend of the rest of the data. You may see something closer to this right here. So, um, do you think the association would be stronger or weaker if humans were removed? Uh, clearly stronger, clearly we have a stronger linear association with the outlier of humans out of the data. You've got, again, just as a recap, that human data point has high leverage being far from the center of X and the center of Y, and it's, um, it's therefore in this case highly influential. You've got the regression line significantly affected both in terms of slope and Y intercept based upon it being present in the scatter plot. So B, is there reasonable justification for removing humans from the data set? Ah, good question. Okay, so we've got 18 species of mammals and then humans. Well, 
Yeah, I mean, there are two ways to argue this, and I've heard this argued a, a couple of ways. A lot of students want to say, no, there's not reasonable justification because humans are mammals, therefore they should all be grouped together. And I get that, but there are other changes that obviously you could come up with. For instance, how we live our lives. Um, we are not as, um, I mean, let's see, there, there are so many things to come up with. Uh, we have medicine available at birth so that you don't have uh, pre-birth or directly post-birth deaths of babies. You, we are not fighting for food all the time. Clearly, uh, people have plenty of it here in the Midwest. Um, yeah, there are all sorts of things between the way we structure our culture to technology to medicine, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that differentiate us from uh, the 17 other mammals in this data set. That, yeah, it only makes sense to remove the outlier of humans. Okay. All right, so last slide here. Below are the scatter plot and regression analysis for the 17 non-human species. They want us to, in A, comment on the strength of the association. Well, okay, that's not too hard. Strength, remember, association for a scatter plot is measured in terms of strength, direction, and form. If all they want us to do is talk about the strength, I mean, I guess you could say moderate, right? The data doesn't seem to be too terribly tightly clustered around a line of best fit that might look something like that. Uh, but it does a decent job. You can see a, a somewhat linear trend in the data. Um, I would not say weak based upon the fact that you've got this cluster right here and maybe even so far as this cluster right here which has that a fairly strong linear trend. I feel like I just drew a snake. That's kind of cool. <laughs> um, all right, so yeah, uh, probably a moderate association in terms of strength. Interpret the slope of the line. Okay, so this is new. Sometimes you will see uh, computer output in the, in the textbook, which I like because on the stats exam, they're going to show you this sometimes as well. Don't freak out when you see this. I think that when, you, when you've seen it one time, you'll be so much more comfortable in the future, and it's not hard to read. Okay, so you've got this table, bottom right, which says that the dependent variable is gestation. So that's telling you for your regression line, you're trying to predict gestation period, which is in days in this case, and that's equal to, well, they mention the variables right here. They say the constant. Well, that's not a, that doesn't help us, but life expectancy does. So we've got something preceding life expectancy uh, plus your y-intercept. Well, watch what this is doing. It's saying for the variable life expectancy, all right, so going down this way, for the variable life expectancy, you have a coefficient. The number in front of that life expectancy is the 15.498, all right? So that must be your slope. Let me give myself some extra room here. Okay, so 15.498 times life expectancy. Um, they've given you your slope, and so therefore, for the variable constant, whoop, drop my eraser, for the variable constant, they give you the coefficient here, which is the other parameter of the regression line, the other number of the regression line you need, the negative 39 point, I'll just abbreviate to 5, okay? So there you go. You didn't have to calculate anything, you did not have to like I've seen some of you guys try to do, guesstimate what these x and y values are. Oh man, that's that's tough. Don't ever make guesstimations from a scatter plot like that. I don't see. Ugh, there's no reason to guess what the numbers are for x and y. It's time consuming. Um, it's frustrating. Don't do it. All right. So. Um, so yeah, we've got the we've got the regression line. Interpret the slope of the regression line. Well, notice again here. Got to be careful with this quarter around this table. Um, M is equal to 15.498. If you put that over one, you will help yourself with the interpretation because units are so important. Um, a regression line again is predicting. In this case, for every one increase in our x variable that we would have 15.498 
um, increased days and why, all right? So for every one uh, year of life expectancy, our regression model predicts almost, uh, well, 15 and a half, basically, um, additional days in the womb, all right? So there is your interpretation of the slope of the regression line. Remember, it's always, just like with your regression line itself, the slope is using x to predict y, and x is your denominator. It's rise over run. Run is your uh, is a horizontal movement, just as x is measuring horizontal distance from zero. Okay, um, so there's an, our interpretation of slope. C. Some species of monkeys have a life expectancy of about 20 years. Estimate the expected gestation period of one of these monkeys. Well, how do you get that? Well, you've got your regression line. That's not hard to do. So you would just do the following. You'd say gestation hat is equal to 15.498 times your life expectancy in years is 20. You don't have to do any rescaling of your units because they had already measured life expectancy in years. Minus your 39.5, which comes out to be equal to um, 270 point four four three days. You know, I don't think it's coincidence that they chose that life expectancy. Uh, why? Because that gestation period, if you divide it by 30, roughly the number of days in each month, you get nine. So they're saying with the rest of the mammals, um, based upon the rest of the mammals, they have 17 other mammals, uh, for a life expectancy of 20 years, you would expect to see the same womb time, gestation time, as humans have. Okay. So that that's actually a pretty strong indicator that our decision to remove humans from the data set right here was a good one, okay? Because clearly our life expectancy, they have this market over 80, so you're, you have a life expectancy over four times that of what we just predicted gestation time for, for the rest of the mammals.